Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the case may be, wherever you are. And welcome to this final installment of our bonus year of the 52 Weeks of Leadership. I've had trouble all year counting which numbered installment we were at. And finally, here at the end of the year, I can confidently say this is week 104 of the 52 Weeks of Leadership. Wow, what an accomplishment. Thank you very much for joining us for it. We'd initially thought of this series as being something that we could do uh, during the pandemic. We started it in January of 2021 as a way to keep connecting with people in our university and school of management community with the Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness. Uh, as we were all stuck at home, social distancing, keeping ourselves and the others around us healthy, uh, and we had so much fun, we kept it going throughout 2022. If you'd like to check out past installments of this series, just plug the term 52 Weeks of Leadership into your favorite search engine. It should bring you to a page that looks a little like this, uh, or it might be a little different. Who knows how it could change in the future. But the point is, you'll find an archive there of a lot of our past installments on various topics uh, around the overall category of leadership. Uh, hi, my name is Jim. I'm an associate professor at the State University of New York, University at Buffalo School of Management, and I'm the faculty director of our Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness that has been putting this series on. Um, and I have the unique honor, I was the first person who did uh, week one of the 52 weeks of leadership in this series, and here I'm going to wrap up our bonus year with week 52 here. To go back in time a little bit, this was the first slide that I showed, uh, and, and I think, you know, there was a reason I did this. There were a couple of reasons. There's usually a method to my madness. I put a slide up that said, let's do something new under the 52 weeks of leadership, and the idea then was, well, we've never done a webinar series before. We've never tried to convey some of these leadership concepts from research and practice in a virtual format. Let's try something new. But I also use that phrase, let's do something new, because in a lot of ways, that's what leadership is. There's a lot of research that says, it's easy for you to get stuck in your leadership comfort zones. In other words, this is the way I've always managed my employees, or this is the way I've always been managed, so subconsciously I assume it's the only way that I could manage something or somebody. It's the only way that leadership could be done, should be done, and we don't think outside the box. Research shows that some of our best leaders, our most effective leaders, are the ones that are constantly thinking, well, here's something I've never tried before. Uh, here's a new initiative to try in this organization. Here's a new way to interact with this employee, with this, with this follower, with this associate that might be even better. Here's a new way for me to look at myself, my own job, my own role. Let's try something new. Uh, so I think that's been a good way to look at it. When I, I, I'll show you a few things that I talked about back in that first installment in week one here 103 weeks later. Wow, that makes me feel old. Do you feel old? I feel old. Uh, I asked the question, you know, a good place to start would just be by saying, what is leadership? This is a class, <clears throat> a question rather that I love to ask during my classes, uh, during my speeches and presentations, my consulting, wherever I go. I'm a nerd. We all collect something. Most people collect things that are much cooler than I do. I collect among other things, definitions of leadership. Because I've found I can ask brilliant people all over the world this question, or even brilliant people within the same organization, close friends, close colleagues, people who work together, and get very, very different answers. Uh, I, I've used the analogy before. It's kind of like the word the. Everybody who speaks English uses the word the. I'm going to use it a ton of times in this presentation. But if you ask me to actually define it and tell you what does the word the mean, I really have no clue. I've also made the point that ethics works the same way. What exactly does it mean to be ethical? Well, doing right or wrong, well, well what does that mean? And leadership, what does it mean to be a leader? I, I ask some people that question and they say, well, leadership is when I tell people what to do and they do it. I ask some people that question and they say, well, leadership is when I have power over somebody or when I have influence over somebody. And my immediate response to that is always, well, okay, if I put a gun to your head, uh, and told you to do something, then am I demonstrating leadership? This is tricky stuff, very tricky stuff. Uh, a year and a half, well, I guess almost two years ago now, I shared my favorite definition comes from a gentleman named Dwight Eisenhower, General Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower. If you'd like to see the long story I told about him, I'm not going to go over it again. Just go back to the archives on the 52 Weeks of Leadership webpage, and you can see the whole stories that I told there. But it got me to this definition that I thought was a good place to kick off the program um, and that I know some of our presenters built on, and I tried to as well. I'm not saying this is the only definition of leadership or the best definition, but it's the one, it's my favorite. It's the one I've settled on. 
Yours might be better. I'm not saying that mine is the best. I just really like this one because I think it covers a lot of ground. Leadership is getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. Not because they have to, not because they're forced to, not because they feel a need to follow the company rules or to conform to pressures or anything like that, but because they genuinely see this is something worth doing. This is something that I want to do. A concept we call intrinsic motivation that we've talked quite a bit about throughout this series. And, and a point that I'd like to make here that I actually got an email about uh, after that week one uh, installment of this series was that getting people to do what you want them to do. Well, what, what is it that we want them to do? Is it just, is it just what you want them to do? No, no, it, it might not be. And this was a great point that someone brought up. It might be something we all want to do or something that originally I wanted to do as the leader, but I convinced you is something that you would want to do. Or maybe it's an idea that I got from you that now we all should want to do. Dwight Eisenhower was really great at going to his soldiers and saying, hey, what am I doing wrong? What new ideas do we have? And I think that's a big part of leadership. But that's not all, uh, because leadership is, also, is not just motivating and influencing people. It's also about developing them, helping them to be the best we could be. We've all had someone in our lives, whether it be a parent or a teacher or a professor uh, or an uncle or an aunt, or a lot of times it's a coach, someone who pushed ourselves, who really believed we could be more than what we were, and that person turned out to be right. And, and it's hard to look back and imagine our lives uh, without that person in them. I think quite often of a high school teacher that I had, his name was James Bailey, uh, who I certainly wouldn't be here doing the things I'm doing now if it weren't for him believing in me. We've had people like that, and I think that's really the essence of leadership, or part of it at least. And so leadership also involves helping your followers to accomplish things that they didn't know they were capable of. It occurred to me, now, now this is where we started, this is the starting point for the 52 weeks of leadership, that leadership involves motivating and developing, getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it and helping them to accomplish things they didn't know they were capable of. Certainly that's not all. You could argue there's a lot of strategic decision making that goes along in that, there's a lot of communication that goes along in that. I'm just trying to wrap it up in a nice tidy package, maybe something that would look great on a coffee mug or a t-shirt, right? And by the way, if you do put that on a coffee mug or a t-shirt, make sure to send royalties, care of UB to James Lemoyne, and probably also to uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower's presidential library. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. That's a starting point for leadership. It occurred to me that a nice way to wrap up our bonus year here would be to say, to talk about something that ironically is what I talk and read and write and think the most about, but I've never talked about on the 52 Weeks of Leadership series. It's ironic, in a given month, I'll probably speak on this to seven or eight different groups and audiences, and yet <clears throat> here on our own webinar series, I've never actually talked about it, excuse me. <clears throat> If you've seen one of my presentations, you can probably guess where I'm going with this, or if you've just seen the title of this presentation, the email you received, or the title of the YouTube you're watching, it's this idea of servant leadership. And what you see behind me, if you're watching uh, at home, this is a picture of Robert Greenleaf, who uh, arguably not the person who came up with the overall idea, because that goes back to people like Lao Tzu um, and Jesus Christ and, and other philosophical and religious leaders. Uh, but this is the gentleman who came up with the idea of that phrase, servant leadership. Now, as I said, I, I talk a lot about this and I, and I want to give you some new content here, so I'm not just going to repeat things I've said before. Let me tell you a little bit about why I think it aligns with that definition I just showed you and what the research says about how to do it. Uh, leadership is a tricky field in the research world. I've said before in this series, part of the reason that I came to the University at Buffalo here at the State University of New York in Buffalo uh, was that this is a school that has a pretty unique history uh, in the leadership research literature. Uh, we've got some of the big names, some of the big developments, uh, names that probably don't mean anything to most of you watching this, but if there's any PhDs or professors, they'd recognize names like Fred Dancero, Jim Mindel, Prasad Balkhandi, uh, names of people who really contributed a lot to the leadership literature. This university, I, I try to tell as many people as I can in West New York, uh, this is a place where major things happen in leadership scholarship, and this is what drove me here. It's a tricky area to research. It's, uh, you know, some people say, oh, well, that's a soft science. It's not a hard science like your biologies and your engineering. And I say, no, there's nothing soft about it. This is pretty hard stuff. Uh, because two plus two doesn't always equal four when you're talking about human beings and human reactions to problems. 
that makes it a little tricky to measure, to assess, to see the results. In fact, I'll share with you this paper from one of our top journals, The Leadership Quarterly, written by Jessica Den, and you can see a long list of other people on the screen, Bob Lydon, Bill Gardner, Jeremy Muser, uh, Robert Lord. A lot of these people are friends and colleagues of mine, a couple of co-authors, uh, brilliant people. They wrote this review paper a few years ago in which they found that there are almost 70 different ways, 70 different ways leadership has been researched in the literature, different leadership styles that have been introduced, like authentic leadership and transformational leadership and charismatic leadership and goal-focused leadership and so on, or leadership traits and leadership behaviors and leadership competencies, leadership outcomes. There's uh, the shared leadership and com complex leadership. The list just goes on and on and on. And this is why, even for researchers, it's hard to wrap our minds around this question of, of what leadership is and how it works and, you know, what are we really getting from this scholarship anyway? So, and another question that comes up a lot is, do all of these different styles matter? Like, like honestly, and, and, and come on, help me out here, practitioners, do we really need 70 different styles of leadership? Do we need to be focused on that? Are there there's certain core things that a, a definition of effective leadership might come back to? One skeptic of some of the so-called moral approaches to leadership um, was this team uh, in a paper that was published in the Journal of Management led by Julia Hoke, um, who basically set out to say, okay, if we compare all of these moral approaches to leadership to what is generally considered to be the, the classical gold standard of leadership, transformational leadership, if you got an MBA or took a leadership class in college, you probably learned about transformational leadership. That's, that's the most predominant theory, uh, first put forth in the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Leadership by James McGregor Burns. Can I tell you, one of my favorite books of all time, if you ever get a chance to pick up a copy, against, again, Leadership, I believe it was published in 1976 by James McGregor Burns. What a read. Uh, more from a political perspective than from an organizational theory perspective, but really informative. From that came this idea of transformational leadership is involving things like inspirational motivation and intellectual stimulation, individualized uh, in, uh, consideration, uh, idealized influence. Yes, those all start with I's because even professors like their acronyms, right? Right? So Julie Hoke and her team, they set out to show just empirically, like with numbers, with data, using all the studies that have ever been published, really, is there anything new and different about these ideas of ethical, authentic, and servant leadership? Um, now, I'm not sure that that's the best or only way to determine if these theories are worthwhile, but it is one way, uh, and it can be informative. And, and the results of this study basically showed that there really was something unique about servant leadership. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, normally in these studies, we find that they, that they all tend to overlap. You know, there's, there's not anything new or different. They don't drive performance in meaningfully different ways. But this paper found, hold on a second, maybe there is something to servant leadership. And, and it was papers like that, and especially a long chain of papers written by a gentleman named Robert Lydon uh, and his wife Sandy Wayne and their co-authors out of the University of Illinois at Chicago that really got me interested in servant leadership because I started thinking, wait a second, this, this is different. Um, it, the evidence, the scientific evidence shows that there's something different. There's something special about this. There's something unique about this. And maybe, just maybe, it's the right approach to leadership for modern times. Uh, in fact, I was so interested in it that I, I tried to write a paper to kind of join this stream of research. So here's a paper that was written, uh, led by a team right here at the University of Buffalo at the State University of New York in a, in a pretty good journal in which we tried to figure out what really is it that makes servant leadership and all these other moral approaches to leadership unique and different. Um, and this is not necessarily a paper that was focused on practitioners or the kinds of people who are probably watching this video. It was highly theoretical and diving into the, the vagaries of the statistics and the assessment and, and what, what the theory and conceptual development says, the nomological nets. But basically the conclusion was this. We, we reviewed hundreds, hundreds of peer-reviewed papers on these moral forms of leadership, including servant leadership. And we found that what was unique about servant leadership was this. Out of all of those 70 approaches that we talked about, all of these different approaches to leadership that are talked about in the world and in research and in consultants and in books, servant leadership had one thing that was really unique to it. And that one thing was it cared. It cared about the community around it. It cared about the stakeholders of business. It said the business has to make money to survive or, if you prefer, 
The nonprofit has to be sustainable to survive. Servant leadership doesn't say, hey, forget about money, forget about profit initiatives. Servant leadership doesn't say we're always nice, we're always friendly, we always say yes, but servant leadership says we care. We care about the community around us. We care about our customers. We care about our employees. We care about our employees' families. Uh, we care more than maybe you're taught to care in a business school or in a leadership training or in a, a management seminar or anything like that. That's what's really unique and different. Remember the previous paper I talked about? I talked about how there's something unique and different about it that really drives performance to another level. Well. We found, what, what's that unique thing? It seems to be that servant leaders demonstrate and give some real evidence of, talk about how much they care about their, their, their colleagues, their customers, and their communities, to put it in the parlance of a local organization we work with, Hodgson Russ. Um, follow, another paper that came up at about the same time as our review uh, was one focused squarely on servant leadership, led by a good friend of mine named Nathan Eva. Um, out of the Monash Business School in Australia. He's a fantastic guy. Actually, some of you may have had a chance to meet him and hear him talk at our last annual Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness Conference in 2022. I'm hoping to have him back for one of those. He's a phenomenal speaker. He did an even bigger review, uh, focused squarely on the servant leadership research, just to determine a little bit more, what does it matter, what does it matter for, and he put together an amazing, amazing graphic with his team uh, with very tiny print showing all of the things that reputable research had thus far shown servant leadership to be related to. Uh, everything from performance and creativity to, to organizational trust and identification, job satisfaction, organizational commitment, reducing turnover, uh, speaking up with creative ideas, speaking your mind, feeling more empowered and engaged at work. Just the research went on and on and on. And let me try to put all of these papers together for you. What the research is saying all in all, and this is why I'm interested in servant leadership research. This is why I talk about it. Basically, all of this put together says servant leadership leads to all these great outcomes. And it does it maybe a little differently, a little more so than other approaches to leadership do. And we have scientific evidence of this. We have literally hundreds of peer-reviewed and an awful lot of replications of these papers that tell us, hey, servant leadership does work. This is a great idea. Uh, this is something that maybe in the 21st century we need to be doing. So I got to know Nathan Eva, who wrote this review at the same time I was writing my review, and we, we kind of hit it off. Um, you know, I like to think we're friends now. He gave me some Australian chocolate, which was delicious. I introduced him to a restaurant here in town called Forno Napoli, which is awesome. So we're, so we're trading some great culinary experiences at the very least. And we wanted to work together on a paper that answered a question that you're probably wondering, okay, if servant leadership is so great, how do we do it? It sounds wonderful. How do we actually put this into practice? Um, and we published a paper together along with a friend of ours named Jeremy Muser, who'd been very active in the scholarship, and Pat Filatico, who was, is the immediate past chief executive officer of the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership. So, you know, we're trying to get a little research perspective, a little practitioner perspective, make sure we're balanced in here. And we wrote a paper for Business Horizons in which we really related servant leadership to something that had happened recently from in the annals of the world's most exclusive club, the Business Roundtable. Now, the Business Roundtable is a group of uh, just under 200 of the world's most preeminent CEOs, CEOs of the leading organizations, your Amazons, your Apples, your JP Morgans, the organizations like that. <clears throat> Every now and then this group gets together and they do whatever super rich people do in their clubhouses. On August 19th, 2019, kind of got forgotten after the COVID pandemic hit in 2020, but they released a statement in which they said in the modern world, uh, businesses should actually be focused on five priorities in no particular order. Uh, number one, uh, they have to be focused on their stockholders. If a business is not making money today, it won't be around to help anybody tomorrow. So yeah, businesses have to make money, but that's not all they have to do. They also have to be focused on four other stakeholders, the Business Roundtable said. Their customers, their employees, their vendors and partners, which, which at first sounds weird, but think about this. If you can't get the materials to make your project, uh, product, if you can't get what you need to offer your services, how will your business succeed? So your vendors and partners are an important stakeholder. And then fifth, the community. In no particular order, that's not last, the community. 
businesses need to make the world a better place. And you may be thinking, well, are they doing much to make the world a better place? Fair point, but at least they've acknowledged that, that maybe there, there has to be something to this. And this stakeholder service, this care, as I said before, that's what sets servant leadership apart. So basically, we've got the world's leading CEOs acknowledging, even if not all of them do it, that this is what the world needs. In our article in Business Horizons, I've, I've copied this chart for you in case you'd like to see it. We looked at those five stakeholders and we tried to put together, well, just here's some things you could do tomorrow. Uh, some things, very basic things you could do to start acting like a servant leader, to, to build up your own skills along these lines. Uh, I mean, and, and a lot of these make perfect sense. Perspective taking. We've talked about that on the 52 Weeks of Leadership series, right? Perspective taking. Okay, I disagree with you. Instead of just saying you're wrong or arguing with you, well, why did you come to a different solution than I did? What do you see that maybe I don't? What have you caught that maybe I've missed? That's a whole different way of looking at conflict resolution. Um, talking about the difference we're making in our community. And you've heard that from some of the executives we brought on over the past two years from great organizations who've talked about how they've made it a salient part of their organizational culture. Hey, not only have we made money, but we've made a difference in the world for our teammates and their families, for, for our clients and our customers, making their lives better. And hey, I want you to be proud of where you work. Here's what we've done for our community, whether that be West New York or somewhere else anywhere across the world. The best servant leaders are always talking about this and incorporating it into their culture. And you don't have to be a top manager to talk about this. You could go to one of your employees who's had a rough day and say, hey, I'm sorry you had a rough day. But you know what? You made a big difference for that customer today. So on behalf of them, I want to thank you. That's a simple example of servant leadership. One more on this list that I'll point out to you, and this is one that I've struggled with and I've tried to be better with, is avoiding distractions while you're talking to people. I actually caught myself, and this is terrible, doing this with my family quite a bit, where if they walked into my home office and I was working on typing an email, I would talk to them without my eyes ever leaving the screen. Maybe you've done the same thing with a coworker in the office, or maybe you've always got your phone out in front of you. It, doesn't it tell you something about your importance to someone if you walk over to them and they put the phone aside, if they turn the monitor off, if they turn their body away from it just to look at you, reinforcing psychologically, if nothing else, that you're the most important thing right now and they're going to give you 100% of their attention. One more thing that I took straight from Bob Greenleaf that I'd like to close a lot of presentations on servant leadership on, if, if none of those floated your boat, here's a very simple thing you could do to dramatically enhance your leadership performance. Uh, you could do this tomorrow. You could do this this afternoon, whenever you'd like. It's easy to do. Most bosses, when I was a manager working for companies like AT&T and Schwann's, I'd ask the question, what are you going to do today to accomplish our goals? I thought that was a good question that managers ask, that leaders ask. What are you going to do today to accomplish our goals? That kept people goal focused, right? That kept me engaged and involved. And don't get me wrong, it's not a bad question. But hey, here's a better one. Maybe you could ask instead, or in addition to it, what can I do today to help you accomplish your goals? What can I do today to help you accomplish your goals? I guarantee you, you start asking that question regularly, you'll get some interesting answers. You'll learn a lot about your people. You'll learn about what motivates them. You'll learn a lot about what challenges they have right now. And you'll learn a lot about what you can do as a manager, as a leader, to make them better. So if none of this other stuff floated your boat, just try that. I started asking that question to my people at least one person once a day. When I was in my last management role before I went to grad school to become a professor, to at least one person once a day, I would ask them, hey, what can I do today to help you accomplish your goals? Try it. You'll thank me later. And that brings to a close this final installment of our bonus year of the 52 Weeks of Leadership. Now, the UB Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness is going to stay pretty busy. We're working with a lot of clients throughout well, honestly, throughout the world. I was going to say throughout West New York, but then I thought of one elsewhere in the United States, and then I thought of another on the West Coast, and then I thought of another overseas. So we're staying busy all over the world, and we are trying to continue the proud tradition at the University at Buffalo of producing top-notch leadership research, really figuring out what this thing is and how it works and how to put it into practice. If you'd like to keep it up, keep up on these activities and efforts with us, I invite you to join us on LinkedIn. You can find us under the UB Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness, or you can find me. Again, my name is Jim. I'm under James Lemoyne. Thanks so much for joining us for this installment and this series. Feel free to reach out through social media. We hope to interact with you soon.